I'm Vito Khaleesi. That's Jonathan Barron, and we're here meeting at the Apple right now. And, John, we're going to get this right off the bat. We promise big Grimace news. We have humongous Grimace news for you all tonight. Big Grimace update. Yeah, Vito. Uh, first of all, good evening and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone listening. After the Mets take two out of three from the Texas Rangers, uh, exciting series. We'll break it all down, but... Like you said, big grimace news, and that is that even despite the Mets dropping the third game of this three-game series in Texas on Wednesday night, grimace is going nowhere, baby, and that is because, Mets fans, the Mets are headed to Chicago, and that just so happens to be where McDonald's headquarters is. So if there were ever a time for grimace to die, this is not that time. The Mets are going to Chi-Town. They're going to Grimace's backyard, and Grimace stays alive. Look, I got to be pretty cool with Grimace. Me and Grimace became friends over the course of that night, and uh, Grimace even sent me a video I sent over to the Mets social media rallying the team on after their fifth win. And I think Grimace, this, I mean, this, is, this whole thing is crazy. This whole thing is hilarious. So this following statement is going to sound like a joke, but it's meant to be a thousand percent serious. Grimace is more than just a character or a mascot or, or he's Grimace is just like Grimace just represents fun and Grimace represents watching baseball and having a good time. Dude, the last seven games, I even the last eight games, because even this game tonight, I've had the most fun watching games that I've had in a long time. And I'm talking about even 2022. I had more fun this week then I could remember in like long stretches in that season, as great as that season was me and my wife sat down the last three nights together, watching the games, having so much fun. And that's what that, this whole thing represents is just like the, just pure natural fun of a baseball season. So don't give up on grimace just because we lost one game. Cause we still won a series and we haven't lost a series since grimace came into our lives. Yeah, no, I mean, dude, you listen to sports talk radio. You talk about the Mets in general, the last, you know, three, four, five days, whatever it might be. And uh, Grimace transcended generations of Mets fans. I mean, I had my cousin who's in his 60s text me about Grimace. Uh, you know, I think Mike Francesa, friend of the podcast, uh, was talking about the Grimace impact on the Mets. Uh, you know, you name it, of course, you know, all the major sports outlets and some not so major sports outlets were picking up stories about grimace so you know i i think what made it what has made it so fun and and such a big thing is that you know fans have bonded over grimace in a way and it's really brought a lot of people together which sounds i don't know strange but it's really the truth um and it's the media and the fans that that gave it life um, and it's the media and the fans that are going to keep a, a fun thing going. You know, it's a rallying cry. And we'll talk about some some Mets rallying cries from their history and some other teams and their crazy rallying cries. I think that that's a baseball thing, though, in general. You yeah. know, I think that baseball just lends itself because it's such a long season. You need to find little things along the way that can give you that second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, so on and so forth wind. And sometimes it's a big purple whatever it might be throwing out a first pitch at a game that whether it actually has to do with a seven game winning streak or not that, you know, gets people going and gets people excited. So, um, you know, like you said, it's been a lot of fun, uh, you know, yourself and Janie and everyone who brought this to life, you know, tip of my cap and, uh, you know, let, let, let's keep it going. Let's just keep the good vibes around the Mets going. And I know that the boys in the clubhouse are going to keep playing good baseball like they have been, and that's what it's all about is, you know, we haven't even reached June 21st, a.k.a. the official start of summer. And we're, all, we're already having the time of our lives. Think about think about what other fun might be in store for us here in 2024 the rest of the way. And I'm going to say one last thing about Grimace before we move on to the top five I don't moments in this series. I don't believe that. <laughs> just, I mean, not ever, just tonight. Well, not, well, just the last on this opening update on Grimace. <clears throat> it's a thought. What just... What if Grimace was just the friendship we made along the way? You know what? I was going to say that when you said Grimace is not is more than I was going to say is Grimace just the friends we made along the way. I'm glad I didn't because you were you were landing the plane with that one. So it's good. But so let's look, let's move on 
I'm sure I'm sure the purple, the beloved purple icon will come up later. Um, John, the like I know I just said I won't bring it up again, but just I've I've seen my name in print a lot this week. Um, and I've been it looks like I have I'm very obsessed with Grimace. Like I was called a, a long time uh Grimace head in one, and then another one I was called a long time Grimace enthusiast. Um and you know what? It's both all accurate. true, but it's just, both accurate as far as it's I accurate. Know. It's accurate for sure, but it's just it's it's when your friends are all texting you that quote, you're like, okay, but it's been fun. Anyway, a lot of good stuff happened this week outside of that that beautiful icon. We're going to go over the top five moments of the week. Well, not of the week, of the series, because the Mets had a great series in Texas. And um, it was just like that first game, dude. I mean, like that first game, I was tired as hell by the end of it of just how much I was screaming and cheering along. That was uh, that was nuts, dude. Yeah, it was the second straight day the Mets had jumped all over a good pitcher. They did it to Dylan Cease on Sunday in the series finale against San Diego. And they did it to John Gray, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, on Monday night. John Gray entered the night with a 2-1-7 ERA. He had been rock solid for Texas, and the Mets just smacked him around. Rockets all over the place for a while. It was a lot of singles. There wasn't a lot of damage in there until... And this will transition us nicely into our top five moments of this Texas Rangers New York Mets series. The number five moment was DJ Stewart really just blew the game open by hitting a three run home run. Uh, put the Mets up seven, nothing uh, for an old head like myself. It was a moment where I said to myself, all right, well, if I fall asleep here because it's an eight o'clock start and I usually, as Vito knows, like to turn in for the night around 8, 30, 9 p.m. if I can. Uh, I wouldn't have felt too guilty about falling asleep because the game was probably uh, all, all but over at that point. I know Brandon Nimmo tacked on a little bit of insurance, and the Mets really kept hitting. They never took their foot off the gas, which you'll have to see because, hey, you know, in baseball, we saw the Dodgers overcome a seven-run uh, ninth-inning deficit on Tuesday night, so you never want to take that foot off the gas. But for DJ Stewart to hit that home run, uh, you know, just an, another reminder that this is a 26-man roster, and the Mets wanted to get Starling Marte a night off. And they did that. And there was no lack of production from the right field spot with DJ hitting that big home run and really just putting the final nail in the coffin for that game. It was a laugher early. The Mets didn't really have many high, high stress pitches they had to throw. And uh, I mean, let's face it. You love a laugher, right? Everyone needs them continuously playing one run games, two run games, close games. That's how you tax out the bullpen, wear out the bullpen. So it was a nice laugher and a big moment for DJ Stewart. That's going to take us to our number four moment, which is another home run. And it's that Brandon Nimmo home run from uh, Tuesday night against Lorenzen. Um, dude, that was a moment where we just came off the high of Monday night and that DJ Stewart home run, the countless, the of a few home runs, just hitting all over the place and just dominating a team against a really good pitcher that I think like, you know, we both said like, oh, you know, like the, the fun could end on Monday night. You're going up against... Uh, you're going up against a good pitcher with a struggling Texas team. We'll see what happens. But when they lose that lead early and like, you're just like, okay, there's still time. You know, we've seen these guys come back. Brandon Nimmo comes up and that first home run to start the rally and just get things going. You felt right then and there, you were like, this team is not out of it. They're going to build from here. Yeah, it was a big moment. I mean, you know, obviously the momentum in the game had shifted after Josh Smith and Wyatt Langford, shout out Wyatt Langford, by the way, taken last year in the draft out of University of Florida. The Gators with a huge win over Kentucky today at the College World Series. I'm not sure if you've been watching, but uh, for Langford, as I'm sure you heard on the broadcast, his first out of the park home run in his big league career. He's a dude who uh, whizzed through the minor leagues, just dominated minor league pitching last year, made the team out of spring training, hit it inside the park homer, but hadn't put one over the fence. Uh, so he did so last night. And we can laugh about it now since the Mets wind up winning. You know, Luis Severino pitched into the seventh inning on, on Tuesday night. Crazy to think that he gave yeah. up a lot of runs, but he pitched into the seventh. He did a good job. Carlos Mendoza let him go back out there. You saw the SNY cameras picking up the discussion that the two of them had in the dugout between innings. He goes back out there, records his 19th out of the night before Mendy finally pulled him. But for Brandon to hit that home run, it, it stopped the bleeding completely. And it once again put the seed of doubt, I think, in the minds of the Texas Rangers. And we know that that Mets dugout 
You know, it doesn't take much for those guys. It takes nothing really for those guys to believe. They are perpetually believing that they are in every ball game, no matter what the circumstance. And for Brandon to lead off that inning and hit that home run and right there cut the deficit to three, the Mets have nine outs to work with. That was massive. And Brandon is on absolute fire right now. He's hit safely in six straight games. He has four extra base hits and eight RBI during that span. You know, he had cooled off there for a little bit, but he is on fire once again. He had a huge series and a big home run for the Mets to really start feeling good about themselves right after a tough half inning. And it led to what amount, what amounted to be a seventh straight victory. So just a really, really big moment for Brandon Nimmo, who has had a lot of those big moments this season. And, you know, you brought up that conversation with Seve and Seve and Mendy. And um, it just made me think of a, a tweet I saw from John Harper tonight talking about uh, what Manaya said after tonight's game. And he said, you saw that moment after Manaya had that rough first inning. You saw Mendy sit him down and talk to him in between. And uh, Manaya apparently said, like, all that Mendy said to him was stop messing around and throw some strikes. That's the kind of manager Mendy is. He has a great relationship with all these pitchers. We've seen throughout this season that, like, the pitchers and Mendy, uh, they, they genuinely speak to each other. And I know that sounds like a basic thing, but... It means a lot more because, like, you have a manager that you're actually able to talk to and say, no, I want to go back out there, and he'll give a guy back the ball. And like we saw with Seve the other night, he let Seve go back out there, and he got one more out to set up Deakman to come out so he didn't have to waste anybody. So, um, yeah, it's just it's really cool to see those relationships. Yeah, I think it's a trust. I think it's a trust. And, uh, you know, trust is earned. It's not given. And, you know, for this to be year one of Carlos Mendoza managing this group of men, for him to have all of that trust from all of the guys on the roster, especially the pitching staff that, you know, on a nightly basis, he's making more X's and O's decisions with that than necessarily the lineup. You know, you deploy your lineup for the night. Yeah, you pinch it here and there. But the pitching during a game, that's where the decisions are. And, you know, for the guys to fully trust him and for Mendy to continuously press the right buttons, um, you know, it's special. It, it's not something that is easily found in this sport. You know, a lot of managers, both here with this team and, you know, throughout the history of baseball, really um, have struggled when it comes to just just getting these in-game decisions right. And, uh, you know, teams prepare and there's sort of a playbook. But ultimately, you can kind of throw that playbook out the window when you're in the thick of it and you're in the seventh inning and, you know, your team's in a jam. Or you're, you're trying to make that decision. You got a big bopper coming up to the plate. Am I sticking with my guy or am I making the move? And, uh, you know, for... For Sean to make those comments, and we've heard so many other guys who've spoken to guys like Jose Quintana talked about his, uh, not instance, but, uh, you know, back in April when Mendy let him face uh, Wilson Contreras and he wound up striking him out, it wound up working, and he told us what he told us about the relationship at that moment with Carlos Mendoza. You know, those moments continue to play themselves out, and each one that we experience as fans and they experience down in the dugout on the field, you know, everyone's better for it. Um, so, you know, Carlos continues to grow as a manager himself. And what a job he's done so far managing this team to this point. Yeah, and uh, so why don't we move on to number three of uh, moments from the Rangers series. And that's going to be that amazing double play from the end of Tuesday night's game. John, I don't know if you notice, I have to pause every time I'm saying a day of the week because a day off in the middle of the week has really thrown me off. I don't know where we are anymore. I keep thinking I'm going to say Tuesday, but so. I'm saying everything right, but I just I just wanted to make clear I am pausing before every time I say it. But the Tuesday night, the uh, the double play to get the first two outs uh, after Mark Vientos had that had that bloop single. Um, you saw Lindor to Jose Iglesias to Pete Alonso. Jose Iglesias just taking taking a athlete size slide to the feet, getting hit, getting knocked down, and then you know what you see in that moment. You see Brandon Nimmo run over from the outfield to give the boys a pep talk and be like, that was sick, guys. Like, keep it up. Like, let's get it. Yeah, I mean, what what a huge moment. You know, like you mentioned, that kind of in-between ball that was really hitting no man's land, a tough play for Mark going back, and a tough play for uh, Brandon coming in, winds up falling in. And with a one-run lead, you know, that base runner is the tying run. The winning run comes to the plate. And for the defense behind Edwin to immediately erase that base runner and just, you know, give Edwin a, a clean slate to start to restart with, really. And then he makes easy work of the third hitter there in the inning. That was massive. And, uh, you know, first of all, Francisco Lindor recently. I know the bat's been just, you know, on fire 
And that's the more obvious thing a lot of people talk about is what he's doing at the dish. Um, you know, even when he is slumping, he never takes a slump out with him to the field. And ever since he got here on day one, he has consistently been the best defensive shortstop in baseball. And of course, shortstop defense, center field defense, leadership, defense behind the plate are also important when it comes to building a winning team. And Francisco Lindor is as steady as it gets at shortstop. You know, for him to just cleanly field that ball, get it out of his glove quickly, put the ball where Jose Iglesias needed the ball, for him to make the turn and the throw over to first base, perfectly executed all the way around. And how about Edwin Diaz, who continues to get big ground balls when he needs them? Edwin was not a big ground ball pitcher, even in his 2022 dominant season. He did not get a lot of ground balls. When runners were on, he was finding his way out of jams by striking guys out. Now, he's inducing more ground balls and giving the defense behind him a chance to help him out. And that's exactly what happened in that big situation as Edwin picks up his second save since returning from the injured list. That brings us to the number two moment from the Rangers series. That's going to be that Alvi double. Um, and I mean, like, I think the Alvi double being the number two moment is also an over-encompassing part of just Alvi being back with the team. You've seen it everywhere the last two days. There's all these different records of the Mets or this and this since when. The craziest one we've seen is that Alvi stat of what the Mets record is when Alvi is starting in games. And it's outrageous. What was it, 18 and one before today's game? So, something like that. Um, look, I think I said this on Sunday when we were talking about all the great offensive uh, prowess by the Mets in the Padres series that, you know, J.D. Martinez was by far the biggest star of that series offensively, definitely carried the freight. And I said, hey, you know, the Mets had this big outburst on Sunday. They scored five on uh, Saturday. Uh, for, it's been a while. It feels like two weeks ago, uh, the Friday night game. But the, oh, that was 2-1, actually. That, that wasn't a high scoring affair at all. But Francisco Alvarez really hadn't gotten going with the bat yet. You know, he was still finding his rhythm at the plate. And I said, just wait. And it's coming. You know, maybe Vito, I don't want to put any any extra work on your plate here. But uh, if you guys go back and listen to our last episode, I said that. And uh, what do you know? Francisco Alvarez goes 7 for 13 at the plate during the three-game series in Texas. And he has the huge two-run double against David Robertson, by the way. Uh, former friend, former battery mate of Francisco Alvarez's last year. So perhaps knowing uh, the way that David Robertson's cutter cuts and his knuckle curve curves and the sequence that he likes to pitch with, especially in certain situations, maybe it helped Francisco out. Uh, definitely doesn't hurt him. But one that Batman, I mean, you know, you have the tying runs on base, eighth inning, and he's down to the count one and two. And at that point, you're kind of in a guessing situation, right? Like, you know, he can go one of three ways with you. He can go, he can go four seamer. He can go knuckle curve. Uh, you know, he, he can go cutter. Uh, David Robertson, that's what makes him so effective and so dangerous in the back end of a bullpen is he's got a pretty nice bag of tricks. So counts one and two. He tries a cutter. Alvy takes it. He throws a knuckle curve. Alvy takes it again, extends the at bat, goes three, two. And then Robertson comes over the plate with a cutter and Alvy puts it up the left field gap, a uh, left center field gap ties the game massive hit at that point you know that the Mets are not going to lose this game coming back from the four-run deficit the way that they did just you know it, he is a special special player and you know it, it's easy to forget just how young he is he is he, he's 21 Vito he's 21 years old and every time he's at the dish he's a threat to go yard he is a field general out there and the truest excuse me he's 22 He's 22. He recently turned 22. So Mia culpa on me. I probably should have looked that one up before I said that. But still, what were you doing at 22 years old, Vito? I was working at a bar. Working at a bar. Yeah. And yeah. I was, I don't even know what I was doing. You're probably selling Marlins great. tickets. Selling Marlins tickets, something like that. Um, but Francisco Alvarez is just, you know, like, like you mentioned, the Mets just seemingly win all the time when he's out there. Uh, you know, you mentioned the Carlos Mendoza quote or the Sean Manaya quote about Carlos Mendoza after Wednesday's game. Sean Manaya also mentioned uh, what Francisco Alvarez said to him uh, during a mound visit in that first inning, which is like, dude, you've got the stuff. Just let's go. Come on. Uh, you know, the pitchers, again, we said this with Mendy. They trust him. The pitchers trust Francisco Alvarez. Last year, Max Scherzer and Justin Verlander, two Hall of Famers with all the experience in the world, raved 
about working with Francisco Alvarez and the awareness he has behind the plate and the way he calls the game and his energy and his enthusiasm and his baseball smarts and all these things. He's just a special player. So a big moment for him. The bat seems back, like I said, 7 for 13 in the Texas series. And what a huge moment for him to tie the game on Tuesday night, helping the Mets get that that come from behind win. Yeah, the only words I could use to describe Francisco Alvarez is aura. He just has ultimate aura. Ah, like, I know what that means, by the way. Yo, do you know about the veggie dance, by the way? No. Is this, is yep. this a baby thing? No, it's not. <laughs> it's not. It was something that I, you know, I was thinking about possibly incorporating one of these days. Okay. Song goes hard. It does. It's a Jersey Joe thing. You know Jersey Joe, right? I do know Jersey Joe. Uh, somebody yeah. somebody that works at the Mets was saying they went to college with Jersey Joe. And they, they had no I, idea. I, I yeah. want that someone to put me in touch with Jersey Joe. I have some ideas. Uh, they now sit right near our new little dance. desk area. Now do the veggie dance. Do you know why I thought? Do you know why? There's, there's, there's something in this house that is going to be in your house. Something for are, are, a baby. Are you coming over? Oh, okay. <laughs> no. I mean, if you want me to, I can. I don't I'm trying to go to the car dealer tomorrow. No, there's something here. That's why I asked if you were coming in tomorrow because I was gonna hate you getting a Hyundai or a Ford. Uh you know, or both. Wh- whatever or both. or both, you know? Could be both. I, well, I've said a thousand times on this podcast what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get Rav Four. You know, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to get these days. But although, although, I did drive a Ford Escape at spring training, and I did really enjoy it. That's what I'm driving these days, Ford Escape. Dude, I told you when when I went to your car when we were in Brooklyn, I was like, Ford yeah. Escape's a good car. It drives really smooth. Brakes are really nice, dude. I know so little about driving though. When I got in that car the first time by myself, the Ford Escape, um. I didn't know that like car you didn't put keys into cars anymore. I just like straight up didn't know that. So I was Dude, holding the like that's been a while. I mean, in Wiz Khalifa's black and yellow, no keys, push to start. Uh-huh. Yeah, I get that. You know but, like, like, I just started driving, so I didn't know. So I yeah. literally was holding the Ford Escape keys that are just a car alarm, and I was looking at different places I could possibly stick it into. Where'd you get your where'd you get your license? Mrs. Puff's boating school? You know, it's even funnier. I mean, like Mrs. Puff's boating school would be hilarious, but you know where I got my license. I know, I, I know. Mr. Ho- Carlos is Hawaii something or another. Mr. Carlos from Hawaii Driving School is where I got my where I got my license. But enough about me and my driving. Let's talk about who's driving in all them damn runs, bro. Pete Alonso, number one moment of the series. The Pete Alonso go ahead runs. Well, Brandon Nimmo scored the run on Pete's go ahead double. He drew the walk there. Um, look, Pete has been. Pete looked pretty hitterish in this series. I'll say that. He, uh, you know, in, in the first inning of game one, he singled in the first run and he kind of just took what he was given by John Gray and just flicked one being as strong as he is over the second base bag in the center field. Uh, he did that a few times in this series where he just went with the pitch, didn't try to do too much, wasn't getting pull happy, which is what you want to see from Pete Alonso. That's when you know he's going well. And all of a sudden, Pete's hit safely in five straight games. Mentioned Brandon Nimmo's six-game hitting streak. During Pete's uh, five-game hitting streak, he too has two doubles, two homers, and 10 RBI. So Pete's been a beast. And, uh, you know, I wrote this down here in the notes that we have for our, uh, our episode. In this series, the Mets had 11 different players pick up at least one hit. They had seven guys with multiple hits. They had nine guys drive in at least one run during the series. Four different Mets homered during the series. So what I'm trying to get at is this has been a collaborative team, full team, 1-26 to effort here during this run. This has been everybody contributing. If it's not one guy, it's another guy. They're not relying on one or two guys to carry the freight. And when those bats go cold... They have no chance. We mentioned over the weekend, J.D. Martinez was getting the job done. Now you got Brandon Nimmo red hot. Now you got Pete Alonso red hot. You had Mark Vientos with a huge couple games there in Texas. Uh, Francisco Lindor has four hits in game one of this series. Didn't have a huge night in game two. Went 0 for 5 in game two. But guess what? Didn't matter because the dudes behind him were getting it done. Your 6-7 guys, Vientos and Alvarez, combined for six hits, three RBI, a double, a home run. I mean, that's a deep lineup. That's that's how are you winning games when you're facing this lineup where there's just 
There's no easy outs. And even if you are getting some of the guys who are at top of the lineup, you know, one, two, three, four, whatever it might be, the guys throughout the entire lineup, it's a challenge one through nine. And what a job by the Mets this week in Texas. What a job. What a performance. Unfortunately, game three slips away, but still they, they, they kept doing the things that helped them get the first seven wins of this winning streak. And that's the big thing here. The Mets have had a seven game winning streak already this year. It ended in L.A. that Sunday in Los Angeles, and they never really rebounded from that. You know, it's important for the Mets to go to Chicago and keep it going here against the team that is right there with them in this wild card chase, which is I mean, it's insane, dude. You know how how bundled things up there. You know, the Mets. Oh, were yeah. Third from the bottom in the National League a couple of days ago. All of a sudden, they're fourth in the wild card race. And and even the teams that are, you know, in, in second place, because there really isn't one team that's pulled away. Even the Braves, the Braves have kind yeah. of fallen back to the pack. The Braves are only the Braves are only what like five or six games ahead of the Mets right now in the wild card yep. standings. I mean, like with that's, a lot of with a lot of head to head left. With a lot of head to head yeah. left. And and like we just said, everything changes in just a few days. I mean, like it's just it's a really exciting time. And like another aspect of this series, Mark Vientos back to back three hit nights. Like that's the kind of stuff you want to see from your young core. This series was so much fun. Forget about the loss on the game three because you still won the series in the first two nights um you know mark Vientos, it was just you know if fans are still not buying mark vientos get get some different you know purchasing advice get some different investment advice this dude hits rockets all over all the time it's insane you know ball meets bat it's 95 plus he is a hard hit machine and like we've said in previous episodes He's a, he's maturing. He's growing as a hitter. He's not chasing as much. He's not expanding the strike zone as much. Um, he's always made hard contact. Did you see? Did you see how frustrated he was with himself tonight after he uh, he went all the way around on that strike two? Yeah. And then obviously, and then he strikes out, and then like just, I don't know, man. Like there was just something about it that wasn't like, um, it wasn't like an immature. I'm furious that I made a mistake. It was like a very like. It was just the passion that you see in Mark Vientos. And all I could think of in that moment was that thing he told us uh, a month ago about how he was like, I went up there and I was like, I'm either going to strike out or I'm going to win the game right now. And I felt like in that moment, like that's that's what he felt like in his head. But we're getting to a place where it's those aren't the only two outcomes anymore. Mark Vientos is turning into a guy where it's no longer going to be strike out or a home run. He's turning into a guy that's like, he can just keep this, extend this lead. He can just keep the rally going. And you know what, dude? There's something going around the Mets clubhouse right now. You know what it is? No. What is it? It's hits, baby, because hits are contagious. Hitting is contagious. What? It really is, you know. And and it's just, you know, they keep the line moving the way they do. It's uh, you know, it, it's been fun. And look, this this Mets lineup is for real. It really is. And as and as the season has gone on, it's been like, huh. All right. Well, now you got Vientos in the middle of it, and and he's been hitting. And then, you know, Francisco Alvarez comes back and J.D. Martinez starts to heat up and Pete Alonso starts to heat up and Brandon Nimmo starts to heat up. And we know what Lindor has done since he was moved to the top of the lineup. And all of a sudden it's like, holy, I'm not going to curse. I don't want to give you any work. It's late. Holy oh, moly. Yeah, late. Holy moly. Holy like, moly. <laughs> this, you know, where where's the out here? Where is the out? Where is the opposing yeah. pitcher catching a break? He's not. Um, so, yeah, time to keep it rolling in Chicago. And this is a good time to go to Chicago. And I don't mean that just because, like, it's a good time to vacation, although it, that is true as well. But you don't want to go to Chicago in April. The Mets had to do that back in 2021. Actually, Francisco Lindor hit his first Mets home run at Wrigley Field. He was wearing a ski mask when he hit it. Oh, dude, um, I remember that. Yeah. You don't want to go there that early in the season. You want to go so now. I, I, went, I went to Chicago for Mets Cubs back in 2018, 11 or 12. Okay. Um, it was oh, so this is Day before week. they renovated Wrigley. Like they put the bleachers out in right field in 2015. The new scoreboard. You saw like old old Wrigley. I saw old old Wrigley back in like 2011, 2012, and um, it was the coldest baseball game. Not maybe not the coldest because the uh, 2015 playoffs were sitting up top. Like we're actually it. It was actually, but there were people brought tarp to the games to put up on the 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 fences up in the back of the uh, 500s in 2015. I remember the, seeing like so many people who had literally brought their own tarp in. It was insane. 
but it was one of the colder games I went to was that uh, that May Cubs game. And John, do you know why else it's a good reason to go to the Cubs right now? Uh, why is that? Because we just finished this amazing winning streak with Grimace, right? And it was an amazing rally cry, and that got me thinking. Rally cries are not new to the New York Mets. Rally cries go all the way back to 69. And what team was that against? That was against the Chicago Cubs. That was with the famous black cat that ran out in front of the Cubs the Cubs back in 69. And then the, the Mets would go on for that historic run where they took first place in the NL East from the Cubs and were able to go on to the playoffs and win the World Series. So what better time to go to Chicago than the team that started it all against the Mets with these rally symbols. And I thought we could have a fun conversation and just before we wrap up this episode and talk about the series itself, why don't we just run down memory lane and talk about some of our favorite rally cry rally symbols in Mets history. I like that. There's been a lot. And, uh, you know, I feel like the Met fan base is just so fun. I feel like it takes a certain fan base to really embrace rally cries, rally symbols, rally songs, whatever it might be. And there's been a lot, even in our short time as Mets fans, you know, I mean, we cover half of the existence of the team pretty much. Um, so, yeah. but even in the time that we've been fans, there's been so many that you can think of off the top of your head. And I think it just takes a certain optimistic fan base that is also a little bit neurotic and also just kind of looking for like anything to get something going and latch onto. And um, so, you know, th that's what Grimace was, right? Like Grimace, Hey, the Mets won the game on Wednesday night and they won again on Thursday night and they won again on Friday. And it's like, Hey, they're three and on the Grimace air. And all of a sudden the catch is fired. But so, Vito, you know, the first one that I really remember or most fondly remember, I guess I would say is um, who let the dogs out in 2000. That was insane. And I remember, uh, you know, after the Mets clinched the pennant, it was on Z100. Then they did the remix. Who let the Mets out? And then I remember, you know, it was on Fox 5. It was just all over the place. I remember Timo Perez squeezing the final out of the NLCS in Game 5 at, at Shea Stadium against the Cardinals. And uh, Who Let the Dogs Out was the song that played. Uh, you know, shout out Vito. You know, you're not the only Vito in Met history. And shout out Tim Gunkel, who were running the show back then. Uh, and, and those guys, you know, I've heard incredible stories about just that whole thing happening, the way it catches fire. But that was that was really special. You know, 99, 2000 for me was the first true postseason runs. I remember as a fan, I was very young and very impressionable. Of course, I had my heart ripped out, stomped on, lit on fire. Uh, we don't have to talk about the end of that October run. But who let the dogs out was was crazy. And man, that really, really got big really, really quickly. And then that was a, such a long-standing effect because then the Mets chant, let's go Mets, became let's go Mets who, let's go Mets who, let's go Mets who. And that's something I feel like the who has been lost in recent years and the who needs to get brought back. You feel like it's been lost? I feel like it just is mostly let's go Mets, let's go Mets, let's go Mets. I feel like that who in the middle, I feel like the the older fans that did that and grew up with that, like they're they're fading out. I remember the who. I mean, but that's that's an I, interesting. No, I know you point. remember the who, but I feel like I'm you don't gonna, hear it. I'm gonna pay attention to that next time, next home game. I'm gonna pay attention to that. We we might need to encourage the fans to start hooing again. Yeah, put it up on the board. We have that big old board for a reason. All right, we're gonna move over to a, a more recent one now. Um, one that I got sucked into big time, John, and that was oh, I can't imagine. It was the parakeet, dude. The parakeet. I got sucked in big time. How many I neon bought, yellow sleeves did you own? Uh, I had one that I that I had like I was like running like talk about superstitions. I turned it into a thing that like I would wear two games or sometimes I would just bring it with me and I would only put it on in like moments of like, oh, like I, I feel like the Mets need to run right now. I'm going to put the, the yellow sleeve on. But I had the yellow sleeve. And then the following year, I believe the Mets did a giveaway that I went to. They did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that I mean, that one came in concert with just the arrival of Ioannis Espedes and the run the Mets went on taking over first place from the Nationals that weekend, that magical weekend in uh, late July, early August, which we spoke about with Daniel Murphy when we had the good fortune to chat with Murph. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was also the uh, the praying mantis. Do you remember that? It didn't become a huge thing, but there was also there was a praying mantis on the screen behind the plate. 
right around yeah. that same time as well. And that was a thing for a bit. But I mean, yeah, that 2015 Mets, uh, 2015 Met team and the way they went on that run and the parakeet and the yellow sleeve and the whole thing, just, you know, I- incredible. Now, it's not really a rallying cry, but just Mets animals. Can we count Yoannis but this is horse? Can we can we put that into the pantheon of of uh, of famous I don't know if Mets I would. animals? It's just because it didn't bring great things with it after. Um, so it I, got I, Jay Horowitz on a horse. So I mean, like that alone, that's is, a pretty good thing. That's a pretty that's good pr- thing. That's a pretty good one. Uh, another um, song. Another song is uh, the Mojo Rising. You know, I know we talked about the 2000 song. This era in Mets baseball was all about music. And hey, you know, music's important. What gets people going at the stadium? It's the tunes that are blasting. And we got the best DJ in the ballpark in the business, DJ Razor. But back in 99, Mojo Rising by the L.A. Woman was the song that the Mets were playing when they were pulling out all the big victories, uh, you know, making the playoffs or forcing a game 163 on the last day of the season by beating Pittsburgh, going into that weekend with their playoff odds very low and having everything they needed falling into place. Um, you know, the heroics during that postseason, the Todd Pratt home run to get the Mets past the Diamondbacks and Fonzie's huge game one in Arizona. Um, unfortunately, it, it ended against the Braves, but even the Grand Slam single, you know, all those big moments are punctuated by these songs that these grown men making millions of dollars rallied around and it spread throughout the fan base and radiated and it gave everyone a glimmer of hope and something to rally around. And it's just a beautiful thing. I mean, I'm, I'm getting choked up here. It's 12, 12 a.m. on <laughs> Thursday morning. <laughs> and we have a song now. What's that? Pandelita. Oh, OMG. yeah, dude. So, I know I texted you last night. First of yeah, all, no, the guys I, doing the guys yeah. doing the selling in the dugout. It's. Yeah, it's electric. Like that song needs to come out ASAP. Watching them all dance, dude. Like they, it, I'm not gonna lie to you. On Monday night, it seemed like they did the dance so much in the first few innings that they like got tired and they stopped doing the full thing by the end of it, uh, by the end of the game. Um, but no, dude. Like, yeah. Oh, I think OMG, o- OMG is uh, is the current one. Um, we gotta, we gotta get that then, one bigger. I, I know Gelbs did the report about it that the Mets were doing the home run uh, song. And then I saw a tweet yesterday that, or on Tuesday, I should say, that uh, the song was blasting and reporters could hear it blasting in the clubhouse, yeah. the guys celebrating before they opened up the clubhouse to to media. So let's keep that going. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to bring up a rally thing. I don't know if it's a rally thing, but I feel like I, I I'm going to, I'm going to say it is one. You you might say it's not, but I'm going to defend it. We follow Lucas Duda. A good Mets folklore. I'd say a good Mets folklore. It was the fact that we had players running it in real time during a stretch, and it was really fun and exciting to see it. Or like the David Wright shirt that they would wear, like that they would pass around when players had a good game. Do you remember that? Yep, yep. So like there's there's just so much weird stuff with this team. It's Being a Mets fan is fun, man. That's what the point of this is. The whole point of this conversation is that being a fan of the Mets is fun. Being a fan of baseball is fun because it doesn't just stop the Mets. You could just be a fan of baseball and you could see other teams who do stuff. Like, look, it sucks that another team in our division won a World Series, but like the baby shark run that the Nationals had was really fun to see. It was, and it was brought on by, you know, I don't want to say a nondescript player, but it was Gerardo Parra who, you know, wasn't Max Scherzer, wasn't Steven Strasburg, wasn't Juan Soto, wasn't Anthony Rendon, wasn't Trey Turner, wasn't any of the big ticket items on that team. Um, But, you know, it just became a thing. And that team rode it all the way to the World Series. I mean, you know, you mentioned there's been a ton throughout baseball history. The Rally Monkey, you know, that was that was a big one. I don't want to say it was the first, but the Rally Monkey has a really, really special carved out place in baseball history for how unique it was like when someone says rally monkey and you're of a certain age and follow baseball you know exactly what that means no questions asked whatsoever the angels also brought out the thunder sticks that year and that was really the first time where thunder sticks became massive um you know going to angel stadium and obviously the way they won that world series with uh with dusty baker giving russ ortiz the ball in game six thinking that that was uh, that was it. It was over. And then the Angels come all the way back for them to win that World Series, man. 
with Barry Bonds having the World Series that he had. That's pretty crazy, but we don't need to get too sidetracked by talking about that. But the Rally Monkey was a great one also. That's like that's a that's a top tier rallying cry slash thing, if if you would. Now I'm I'm gonna bring up one last one because it's twelve fifteen. We're about 40 minutes in, and I still got to edit this, and I'm getting sleepy. But my favorite non-Mets one in general is DJ Kitty from the Rays. Um, DJ Kitty, I what I was told by a fan of the a very close friend of mine who's a big Rays fan from St. Pete told me that the Rays players were sick of seeing Keyboard Cat on the scoreboard and then themselves had made DJ Kitty, which is just a cat. That they obviously are put, propping the hands up of in a raised jersey and a backward raised hat, playing a DJ hero. If you remember the Guitar Hero spinoff, DJ Hero, sitting at that while while a song that I can't sing plays because we'll get taken down. But DJ Kitty is one of my favorite things, and it's crazy because like DJ Kitty has now become, I would say, the most popular raised mascot. Yeah, Raymond has totally fallen off. And that's how you know it was a good, effective thing because DJ Kitty st uh, st uh, stuck around, withstood the test of time. So that's a good one. I know that... Uh, so I kind of like Bronxy the Turtle, honestly. I thought that was very weird and unique, but the Yankees didn't make it past uh, the first round in that 2018 LDS against Boston who wound up winning it all that year. But the Red Sox idiots thing, that was a good one too. And I think that we'll, we'll cap it there and we'll we'll talk about the Cub series and some minor leaguers who have been performing well recently, but a bunch of idiots because it started in 03. And obviously we know how that season ended for the Red Sox. And then they brought it back and Johnny Damon grows out the hair and the beard. And you got Kevin Millar, um, you know, for the team to just call themselves a bunch of idiots. And, uh, you know, it was almost like, it was almost like, Hey, we're like, you know, we're, we're too dumb to, uh, you know, be focusing on, on the losses. Like we're just, we're, we're, we're tunnel vision here. Um, you know, and for that team to overcome what they did, the three Oh deficit in the ALCS and also, uh, you know, just 86 years of curses. And that, that obviously weighs on a team, uh, the idiots in Boston, that was a fun rallying cry that, that went, went the distance. So that was a good one. Uh, all right, John, we're about to jump right into the Cubs, uh, preview, but I did just see on Twitter as you we were talking, I did get a little distracted. The Rangers did acknowledge this is I want to ask what you think about this because I'm actually pretty annoyed right now. Rangers tweeted not tonight grimace. Do you think you have any right to like I, it's you lose you lose the first two. Do you have the right to get a little ballsy and talk smack about grimace at the end of that? Like, do you I think what not. do you think? Do you think do you think you ended the streak so you could do whatever you want? Or do you think it's like. Maybe you guys should go out and win a few more baseball games before you talk smack. What do you think? I have no problem with that. You know, they're trying to get in on it as well. Uh, you know, ad admins just playing, playing it cool. So I got no problem with that. And hopefully Mets admin comes back with, an, with a good one, with a zinger. I'm sure they will. They be, I mean, I, I know the Mets, the Mets have been harder. The Mets have been a busy the Mets admins. Will, Janie, Hunter. Uh, they've all they've had a busy week boxing the admin. I don't know. I feel like it's better. I mean, I know we want to give everyone the great credit they deserve because uh, they're the best in the game. But I feel like also you want admin to just be. I didn't say last names. I, know, I didn't say it's last like names. Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. You know, you you don't want to know how the sausage is made. You just want a little icon. that's a Met logo, a big beautiful Met logo, uh, just firing back at people. So you're right. Well, look, yeah. let's jump into this Cub series. Uh, this is the first. Mets Cub series. Oh, let's jump into the Mets Cub series. This is uh Mets Cubs played earlier this year over at City Field. We're going over to Chicago. Got some day games lined up, and that's awesome because I think last year, I don't think they played any day games last year when they went to Chicago. I could be wrong. Yeah. I'll look it up while you preview some stuff, but I'm pretty sure last year they didn't play any day games, and it was really weird because, like, that's what you expect when you go play at Wrigley. I'm checking right now. I'm going to have it in a second here. Uh, yeah, I can't find the start times. But anyway, yeah, the first time these two teams met of a four-game series, end of April, early May, a bunch of close games, crazy endings, a walk-off win for the Mets in the series finale. That was the Lindu the Lindor flu game. 
Uh, there was the game where Pete Alonso was caught uh, trying to t- not caught, but thrown out trying to tag up for the final out of a game. There was one the game that uh, the series opener, Lu- uh, Luis Severino, Jamison Tyone, they both pitched well. Uh, we know Sevy had the no hitter late in the game, and then uh, Christopher Morel hit a go ahead homer in the ninth inning. So all four of those games decided by two runs or fewer, back and forth, crazy outcomes. A big weekend here, like we mentioned, these two teams fighting it out for positioning in that wild card race. Each win, a two game swing, you can uh, earn a win for yourself and set back the team that you're fighting with. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the pitching matchups and uh, one guy in particular who could be in for a big weekend at Wrigley Field. So on Friday, it'll be Jose Quintana, the former Cub. He'll be facing off against Shota Imanaga, who right now is the favorite for the NL Rookie of the Year. He's been so good since coming over from Japan. Of course, Quintana spent four years with the Cubs. He also spent time on the south side. That was really where he had his breakout before the White Sox traded him over to the Cubs. During the 2017 season, Quintana, he's made 42 starts in his career at the friendly confines. So definitely a familiar spot for Jose Quintana, who comes off a really strong start, six innings, two hits, a season high, six strikeouts against the Padres last Saturday. Speaking of Saturday, this uh, this upcoming Saturday, it'll be Tyler McGill. He'll be facing up with Jamison Tyone, who, as we just mentioned, pitched well against the Mets back in April. Tyler has been good, and he's been missing bats and making guys chase. Last two starts, a whiff rate of 30% and a chase rate of 35%. And those two, obviously, there's some correlation. The more you get guys to go fishing, swinging on pitches out of the strike zone, the more swing and miss you're going to get. But it's tough to make major league hitters look foolish and and guess and go fishing the way that Tyler has. So Tyler will try to keep it rolling. He's been really, really good since he's returned from the injured list. And it's just a deeper rotation when guys like Tyler McGill and Sunday starter David Peterson are pitching the way that they are. Peterson got the win on Monday. We didn't even mention the great job that David Peterson did throwing six innings, continuing to induce a lot of ground balls, his ground ball rate on the season, 54%. Now that's pretty common for David Peterson. We've seen that from him throughout his career. He's always inducing ground balls with that heavy sinker. But the biggest thing for me from David Peterson is he's throwing strike one. He's not falling behind. He's not losing guys. He's not going 2-0, 3-0 constantly and just giving in or just putting guys on, he has only issued eight walks thus far. And that's huge for David Peterson. That's the next big step for David Peterson to continue to grow and continue to get better as a major leaguer. And it's really the only thing that's held him back in the past was he put himself in bad spots sometimes. He has not done that thus far, and that's why he has been as successful as he has been since he made his season debut. And he will go up against Javier Assad, by the way, who's been an absolute thorn in the side for the side of the Mets. He's made two starts against them. Assad pitched one of those games in September of 2022 when the Cubs came into City Field after Labor Day and swept the Mets and kind of started the Mets' little teeter there, which we know how that ended. Javier Assad shoved, and he pitched well against them earlier this season as well. So uh, the Mets will be up for a challenge against Assad, who they just have not been able to solve so far. And, John, I did look it up. It was three six forty starts last year at Wrigley, so... Uh, interesting a year of no day games in chicago you get some day games um but yeah man i mean i think what is a funny thing about this series too is when they first flexed that game to sunday night baseball a lot of mets fans were like oh this is stupid the mets are already out of it cubs suck why are we flexing this to sunday night baseball this game is meaningless blah 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 and now you have a Pretty important Sunday night baseball game with two teams who, like you said, are battling it out every night. You got a Mets team on the rise right now. You got a Cubs team who's been going through some struggles who are definitely not going to want to get grimaced. So it's going to be a really fun weekend. Um, but we're going to start. We have two more topics before we get out of here. And Hold on, real one quick, of them- real quick. I want to shout out two great moments in our lifetimes that happened on Sunday night baseball between the Mets and the Cubs. Two great games. First one, okay. 2006, the 11 run inning. Do you remember that one? Yes. That was huge. I think Cliff Floyd had uh, had a grand slam in that in that one. Number 2 in 2007, one year later, Tom Glavin wins his 300th career game under the lights at Wrigley Field also on Sunday night baseball. So back-to-back years, Mets Cubs on Sunday night and incredible things happen both times. So, uh, it's always a fun time when these two cities get together. And there will be a lot of Mets fans out there in Chicago. You and I, 
thought about going, considered going. Hey, we still could. There's still time, by we the way. We still could. We there's, still there's could still go. Time. There's no, a, no there's one's an stopping us. We're grown ups. We could do what we want. There's a whole off day. It's not even a long flight. Um, yep. But before we move on, we're going to end the episode with some prospect talk. But uh, we definitely wanted to take a second to just acknowledge the passing of Willie Mays, uh, somebody who Mets fans, Mets fans owe a lot to because the birth of this organization is in the New York Giants and Mrs. Payson's love of her fir- her favorite baseball player, Willie Mays. And that's why she made that promise to Willie all those years ago. That's why his number hangs in the rafters. And Willie Mays is somebody who wasn't just important to baseball, but he was incredibly important to New York. He was a hero of New York City, a guy who, like, you'll see pictures of just him playing stickball with the kids of Harlem just after leaving the polo grounds, walking to the polo grounds. It's uh, it's a really sad day for baseball fans to have had this happen. You saw in the broadcast, Heath Hernandez talking about the moment he got to tell Willie that he's the best ball player he'd ever seen. And um, that's the main thing you hear from anybody who did get to see Willie Mays play baseball. They will say he is without a doubt the greatest baseball player they ever got to see live. And um, there's a lot of debates in baseball, but it seems across the board that one is uh, that one's pretty much in agreement that if you saw Willie Mays play, that was your number one. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you and I never saw him play, but I, you know, <clears throat> I remember my dad telling me stories all the time, and I would always ask my dad who he thought the best player ever was, and I would argue with him. And obviously, younger people like to, uh, you know, focus on the the generation that they they've seen and elevate that. But uh, you know, over the years, all the conversations that I had about Willie Mays with my dad, and all the stories my dad told me about Willie Mays, um, I can honestly say that my my dad convinced me of that. Uh, you know, and, and Willie Mays epitomized the five tool player, uh, with his power, his speed, you know, all the incredible defensive plays he's made or he made throughout his career. Uh, the basket catch, obviously being one of them, uh, you know, they, they don't make him anymore like Willie Mays. He, uh, you know, it, it goes without saying you, you said special, you know, to the people of New York, I'll go on further. He was special to this country. You know, there's a reason why baseball is considered and called the national pastime. Um, you know, it's players like him, legends, giants of the game. And I'm not saying that because the team he played for, but because the stature he had as a baseball player, you know, that that's what has made this sport what it is over the decades and, you know, really a century. Uh, you know, guys like Willie Mays, baseball is all about its storytelling. That's one of the most beautiful components of this sport. And, uh, you know, it's important that we continue to tell the story of Willie Mays. And that's why it's such a blessing. And the Mets did so right by Willie to retire the number 24. That number will be up in the rafters at City Field and uh, whatever the next stadium is one day forever and ever and ever. And, uh, you know, our our organization is lucky that Willie Mays was part of it, both as a player. And then he came back as a coach as well. Uh, that yeah. he came back to rejoin New York baseball and continue to share all the wisdom that he has about this great sport with young players in the Mets organization during his time as a coach. Uh, so, you know, like you said, a sad day, uh, a sad time for baseball, um, but a celebration of Willie Mays and, uh, you know, it'll be nice for the Mets to come home and the Mets, you know, across major league baseball on Wednesday, you saw all the home teams having their moments of silence and honoring Willie Mays. Uh, and we will do the same thing and it'll be extra special, I think, because we'll have both the Mets and Yankees, New York fans all together in that stadium on city field and without guys like Ruth and Mantle and DiMaggio and then Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese. And then of course, Willie Mays, you know, all the players who our grandparents, our great grandparents fell in love with, were obsessed with, you know, would always go to the polo grounds or Ebbets field or Yankee stadium, whatever team they rooted for to see play, you know, baseball is passed down generationally. So if it weren't for those legends that I just mentioned and many others who I didn't mention, would we all be loving this game? Would we all be at City Field on Tuesday night rooting for our team, our side in the Subway Series? Remember, Mets and Yankees wasn't always a thing. It used to be Brooklyn Dodgers and Yankees, and that was a World Series rivalry in so many years. Or Giants-Yankees, those two teams playing in the World Series. So it's really cool that the Mets and Yankees and all the fans will be together to honor Willie and his impact on New York baseball. I'm really looking forward to it. 
Uh, and I'd also like to recommend the HBO documentary. You can get it on HBO Max. Say, hey, Willie Mays. Uh, I watched it when it came out. It's it's a fantastic documentary. Um, they have a post credit scene where his number retirement at City Field gets a nod, and it's a uh, it's a really it's a really great doc. Um, also, Jay. Also, uh, Jay Horowitz and I recorded uh, a special edition of Amazing Conversations that's going to drop either same day that this episode comes out or Friday, um, where he called up Lee Mazzilli and they just had a conversation about a guy that both of them had been fortunate enough to have a very good friendship with. Lee um, not only played with Willie, but also played under him when Willie was a coach and um you know, it's uh, it's it's really cool that there's still people who are able to tell those stories. And like you said, John, pass that down generation by generation. Yeah, the thing I was going to add was on Wednesday or Thursday night, excuse me, uh, Major League Baseball is having a game at Rickwood Field in Alabama where Willie played for as a member of the Birmingham Black Barons. So wait, hold on, let me make sure I got that right. So that's really neat. And obviously, you know, it's uh, unfortunate timing. I mean, there's never a good timing for this to happen. Um, but it's also in a way special because Willie will be honored in such a special way at this game on Thursday night when the Cardinals and the Giants play in this really, really special, unique and just an, an, an outstanding initiative by Major League Baseball. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. If you guys, you won't have Mets baseball on Thursday night, check that game out. There will be a lot of history and there's a lot that we can all learn uh about you know this area in our sport all right so let's wrap this one up we're going to talk about five prospects you should be paying attention to in the mets player development system number one is a double a player wilkin ramos he's a pitcher who's got a 1.27 era and 21 innings pitched has not allowed a home run only has six walks um so it's uh you know like you hear the names blade tidwell you hear the names christian scott tyler stewart Names like Wilk and Ramos are names you should be looking at as well, and you should be keeping an eye on. You should be looking at that box score every night, just looking at who's pitching and do a little research on them. Yeah, and if you're looking for the next perhaps Daniel Nunez, a guy that maybe wasn't on the radar that can come up and help the Mets in the bullpen, maybe Wilk and Ramos is that guy. Uh, you know, he's, he was in the athletics organization for a little bit, uh, the Pirates for a little bit, Mets acquired him, and he's been great this year. So not saying he is Daniel Nunez, but again, you know, the Daniel Nunez of tomorrow are somewhere in single A, double A, low A, FCL. Oh, yeah. You've been a sniffly boy for the last week. All right. Let's move on because it's getting late and I need to edit. Rowdy Jordan, uh, Binghamton Rumble Ponies, is on a 10-game hitting streak. Rowdy's a guy that John and I have had the pleasure to, to speak to on two separate occasions. Spent a little time with him over at the Arizona, Arizona Fall League. And uh, not surprising to see a 10-game hitting streak for Rowdy because Rowdy Jordan does one thing. And he hits. He does. Well, he does a lot of other things, actually. He stole 30 bases last year, switch hits. I meant play if really he does. Off. I don't know why no, I said I, I he know, does I know what thing. you mean. I, I know what like, you mean. You know what I meant. I meant if I he does one meant. thing, he hits. Like, compliment. You made it seem like I was insulting him, John. No, I'm no, tired. no, no. I, I know you weren't. But I want to make sure that people that are listening to this and may not be as familiar with Rowdy get a good understanding of the kind of player he is. He's nails. Uh, you know, legend in Mississippi State, helped them win their first college World Series ever. Uh, just a beloved, a great NCAA player of all time. And he is a really, really valuable player who can who can do a lot for a team. Of course, teams are always looking for those kinds of guys. And uh, like you mentioned, heating up 10 game hitting streak, grand slam on Wednesday night to extend the hitting streak to 10. So uh, good job by Rowdy. Hot of late. Keep it up, Rowdy. All right, let's move over to the FSL. Talk about Joel Diaz, who went four and two-thirds scoreless innings, pitched five strikeouts in his last start. He's got 20 strikeouts on the season this year for the Florida State League PSL Mets, John. Yeah, this has been really a kind of a reestablishing year for Diaz uh, after the injury, coming back from the injury. Uh, you know, just setting, setting a base for him to con continue to build upon. Started the season with the FCL Mets, had a lot of success there. Uh, the Mets were quick to move him to the Florida State League, like you mentioned, and he's really had the same results. So it's been a, a good foundational year coming off the injury for Diaz. Uh, you know, he's, he's halfway through it. They started slow with him. We'll see what the plan is the rest of the way for a really exciting young right-handed pitching prospect. 
All right, our fourth player, Jesus Baez, over in the Florida State League, who right now at the age of 19 has the most home runs by a teenager. Um, and, you know, we were talking about Francisco Alvarez a few minutes ago on this podcast, who at the young age of 22 is just tearing it up. It's really exciting to see these young players moving up the system, showing power like Jesus Baez has. Yeah, and you don't really see this kind of light tower power much in the Florida State League. Uh, he had a massive home run off the Corona Beach House rooftop in left field at Clover Park on Tuesday night. That was his ninth homer of the season. So you mentioned that he's uh, the youngest player with that many home runs in the league. Uh, he, he's really taken great steps this season. So we'll see what challenge lies ahead for him next. When we talked to David Stearns, he explained the process that the organization kind of works with and goes through when they decide when it's time to present a player with a new challenge in the minor league system. Uh, and, you know, like, like we mentioned, Jesus is plenty young. He's still a teenager. He's two years younger than the league average age. So it wouldn't kill him to continue to just dominate the Florida State League a little bit. But it's really exciting for him to be having the success he has been because usually it's it's guys that are a few years older that start to figure out that Florida State League and then get themselves promoted to high A. So for him to be doing it really from the start of the season all the way through up to today uh, consistently, that that's a great sign for a really exciting young prospect. And our final player we're going to talk about over in the Complex League is Simone Juan, who uh, had a challenging year in the FCL last year, but has already matched his hits total from last year and has six home runs, which are tied for the FCL lead. And he's only 18 years old. And we, like we just said about Jesus Baez, it is really exciting to see these young guys just really showing such power at a young age. Yeah, there was a lot of hype and excitement surrounding Simone Juan's name coming out of his IFA class. Uh, and like you mentioned, he struggled last season. Uh, some of the hype might have cooled off a little bit. But, you know, we're talking about uh, a very young man, you know, 17, 18 years old. Um, and you, you can't give up on these guys. You know, we have to remember these are human beings who are coming over from, you know, diff a different part of the world um, and experiencing brand new things, challenges that they've never had to go through as human beings. Forget baseball players. Uh, so that takes time to adjust to. It's not just hitting the curveball or, you know, keeping up with 97, 98 miles an hour. It's it's all of it. It's the entire package. So Simone Juan has really, really been uh, one of the bigger breakout players in the organization this year. And, uh, you know, maybe your breakout isn't the best word to use because he was a highly touted prospect after the Mets signed him. But after what happened last year and his struggles to where he is right now, thriving, in the complex league as a very young man, the age of 18, like you mentioned, uh, you know, th that's exciting. And, you know, th this Mets farm system, you know, you, you look one through 30 and beyond, like it runs deep and there's guys that you can dream on right now that are closer to the show. And there's guys you can dream on that are at the level that Simone Juan is at in the Florida complex league, or there's guys that you can dream on uh, in the Dominican summer league, a guy like Giovanni Rodriguez, who the Mets, made the highest uh, IFA signee in franchise history this past winter. There's just a lot of talent that you can really, really get excited about. And the Mets are continuing to add that talent. Draft's upcoming soon. And before you know it, it'll be January. We'll have another IFA class. So uh, always lots of talent to talk about in this Mets minor league system. And that's where we're going to end this one, everybody. Uh, you can follow us right here uh, on well, I say right here. I mean, that's you could be listening on any any wait any you know, you wrap up. of formats. I want to just say one more thing. Two more things. They're quick. First of all, I want to shout want to shout out Perry, big listener of the show. Shout out Perry. Second of all, I promised a guy who's going to go off this weekend. I couldn't let that promise go without following through on it. Pete Alonso has 15 homers in 31 career games against the Chicago Cubs. Do you know what that comes out to if you if you extrapolate that over a full 162 games? It comes out to 78 stinking homers. 78. Move over, Barry Bonds. Thank you guys for listening. You could listen to us wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify. We're available on the Mets YouTube. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. I'm at Vito F. Khaleesi. John is at JMB9191. Uh, we'll be right back here Monday morning slash Sunday night after that Cubs series. Let's keep it up. Keep up the grimace memes. Keep up the energy. The boys are hot. No sleep till playoffs. Let's get it.
Um, 